Hello friends, this is Devangi Dalala. I'm an audiologist and speech therapist and I'm again here with talk show. Uh, this time we have all the professionals coming from all over the world who speak uh, about how to take care of hearing health as far as diagnosis concerned, treatment, precautions, awareness and you have been a lovely audience. You have been hearing all the speakers and you have come up with a lot of questions and we have all the answers for you. Today we have a wonderful topic that is uh, private practice with humanitarian touch. This is something the need of the day and we have a speaker who is a personality who knows how to handle the private practice. She's also having a humanitarian touch in her practice and she also has the management skills. I think she's one of the role model for all the audiologists because she has uh, you know combination of all the work you know she has done over the years so friends i have dr yan uh, diane rodden with me uh, she is from colorado and she is with us for the talk show where we are going to talk about private practice with the humanitarian touch dr diane rodden aud has been the honor of Longmont Hearing and Tinnitus Center in Longmont, Colorado for 18 years. She's a proud member of Entheos Audiology Cooperative and has dedicated, has dedicated her time and expertise in global outreach, humanitarian audiology in India, Peru, Guyana, St. Lucia, and Costa Rica. In 2020, she pioneered a local nonprofit project with five other Colorado Anthios members called Hearing the Call Colorado. She's also the host of the Hearing Journal podcast. She's, an, she's a professor at the University of Colorado teaching business management and ethics. Dr. Rodden is considered as an industry expert in social media and marketing with published articles in audiology today, seminars in hearing, audiology practices, and the hearing journal. Hi, Rodan. I welcome you on our talk show. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here and to talk about a subject that is um, of great meaning to my heart. So let me just ask you, what do you mean by humanitarian touch? I mean, it's so... Uh, touchy topic and here in pandemic everybody is in difficulty and everybody's looking for a doctor uh, you know who have uh, you know shown them a path or who want who who are supposed to show them a path you know so where doctor having a humanitarian touch is the need of the day because everybody is in difficulty they they want to see you know how best they can come out of the challenges so according to you what exactly you mean by humanitarian touch? What I really mean is, you know, just getting back to the basics, truthfully, is seeing people as fellow human beings, regardless of their financial situation. Um, you know, whether that be in other medical care, you know, during the pandemic, or simply in the ability to communicate and to hear the people that they love, regardless of their financial means. So helping those people that are really most vulnerable, whether that be, you know, halfway around the globe, for me, uh, in another country, or really in my own backyard. Oh, that's uh, really important, because today, uh, you know, those people who are really in difficulty, and especially when you deal every day with the people having uh, hearing disability, you know, uh, and especially where hearing is not seen, you know, this disability is not seen. So that's where, you know, there is a lot of ignorance uh, about it. So people who have really hearing health difficulty, what they go through and uh, how they should overcome it. I think we are the professional, are the right person to show them, you know, uh, what is the requirement of uh, the day? So according to you, when you do a practice, you know, how importance you give to the humanitarian touch? I mean, I think it starts with that. It has to start with why, why you started doing, you know, helping people hear better in the first place. What drew me to audiology um, was not the ability to necessarily take home a paycheck. I mean, obviously you have to 
pay your bills, but um, it's the desire to help people of all ages communicate and hear the people around them and the sounds around them that, that are important to them. Um, I think we are in an unprecedented time, especially with the pandemic. I say, I feel like almost every day, this is the worst time in history for people with hearing loss. You know, you've got isolation, you've got masks, so everyone has lost visual cues, you've got muffling um, of sound. So, you know, imagining not only that you're in this position where um, you're trying to protect yourself, but now you have an even greater difficulty um, connecting with other people because of a hearing loss. So, I mean, I, I think we have to get back to the basics of helping people with the human touch and, and yes, sustainably, and, and also in a way that um, is supportive of their needs as, as a human being and meeting them where they are, I, I guess is what, what I would say. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we are so lucky that we have a profession where you can have a commercial, you know, work, as well as you can do a humanitarian work. So this is something like we are honored with that, you know, such profession where, uh, you know, we can uh, do both uh, and balance can balance both. And, and, you know, it's the commercial work that is the vehicle for you to be able to do some of the other work. So it, it has to be a sustainable place from a business model, um, but yet it, it also makes me a better private practitioner to do this outreach. You know, if it's only focused on the bottom line and the numbers and all of that, you know, it's, it's somewhat of an empty experience um, from, from my professional point of view. So it has to be a combination of both. I mean, recently people have been uh, concentrating, like especially in India or, you know, a country like where you have worked in Peru and, um, you know, South Africa, where even NTOs I have worked with in one Mozambique project, you know, people look for uh, a quantity of work, you know, that we have given hearing it to so many people. But uh, really, if you look at the hearing problem, it has to be designed or it has to be to an individual's requirement. It should be done in a qualitative way. So, I mean, what, what do you feel how one can change about that? You know, con not concentrating on the um, quantity and concentrate on the quality. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, the quality has to be there. I mean, without the quality, you know, the quantity really doesn't matter. Um, you know, we, we bring our best practices to the table, the things that we know from a clinical standpoint of what work for people and, and what are the latest in treatment options for their hearing loss. Um, and if you don't come to the table with that, it's the rest of it's kind of um, irrelevant in, in my opinion. But um, you know, for me, I think the, the biggest thing that I can, can kind of translate for, for everyone is, you know, it's not something you do on your own. You know, if you're trying to um, run your own private clinic and do, you know, community outreach all by yourself, it's, it can be so overwhelming. Um, it just feels like, you know, there's not enough time in the day. But I, but I think, you know, the ability to partner with other colleagues is really the only way that for me, it, it makes sense and, and works. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, of course, when you want to do a quality work, uh, you know, the whole team is uh, involved in uh, doing the best uh, work out of it. So, I mean, it, you have also worked on the ethics and the quality of practice. So what exactly, uh, you know, kind of practice which you will suggest for an audiologist to do in the best possible manner? And I want to make sure that I understand the question. Um, so from, a, from an ethical point of view, I mean, obviously, you, you have to do your due diligence of making sure that your diagnosis is correct. Once you have that diagnosis, knowing, you know, obviously making that 
judgment and and decision, you know, does this person need some kind of medical care outside of what an audiologist can provide? That's primary. If it's something that we can shift or change for them um, through medications or through a surgical procedure, that has to be primary. And then if that you know, if it comes back around to now it's time to treat their hearing loss and it's not something that can be, you know, quote unquote fixed with, with those things, then really understanding what are that patient's needs? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, you know, where are their challenges and really involving the patient in that discussion so that it's not just a like, I know everything and here, let me put these things on you. Um, it's, it's a collaboration between what the patient's desires and needs are and what is available um, and what your expertise can bring to that. And not just from the initiation point of, putting hearing aids on someone. I mean, I think that's the first step, but I think what often happens is that that's where it, it can end for people or they think that's the end. That's actually kind of the beginning. You know, if we're really gonna treat people for lifelong, we have to educate them, um, treat whatever issues or, or concerns that they have, and then help them to navigate the way forward and how things change in their lives as they as they get older or has their experience changed. We walk alongside them. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, even in our uh, practice, you know, especially in India, you know, where uh, the government support is not yet there for the hearing aids. I mean, uh, which are the technology available, which are the hearing aids available, which can change the life of people. I mean, that has to be uh, given information to the patient. So exactly the patients knows, you know, to, uh, how to go about it. I mean, that's a really wonderful, you know, the point you have mentioned. Now, when, when it comes to uh, dealing with, I mean, you are as a human being, uh, you know, of course, then you are a doctor. So how, how, does a human relationship with the other human and a doctor relationship with the human, uh, uh, you know, you would like to put in? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, oftentimes we get so busy and, you know, you're thinking about the next 10 things on your, on your list or the next 10 people that you might be seeing. And, you know, always trying to, to circle things back to the person right in front of you and being very present with that person that's sitting right there and what their experience is. I mean, I may have been doing this for 25 years. This is their first experience. Um, so treating everyone with that respect and, and empathy and, and helping to understand what their fears might be or stigmas that they might have um, been told or, or, you know, have brought to the table with them, um, you know, and helping them to kind of move some of those things aside and to recognize that, you know, we're here as an ally you know, we're, we're their ally on their pathway, regardless of where they're at. I mean, you can help people um, really by giving them permission to show up exactly as they are and, and offer solutions, not just, you know, tell them what to do. Yeah, I think that human connection is the requirement uh, between even a doctor and a patient, you know. Uh, and that connection, if it works out and it leads to a faith in doctor, you know, today, you know, in pandemic, you see all over uh, places, you know, uh, we are not praying God, we are praying all the doctors, you know, who are helping us. So I think uh, that faith creates by, you know, when you have a connection with uh, each other, you know, as a patient and uh, relation. So that's something. And, and I don't know about you, but I've, I've never met, um, you know, I've, many audiologists who didn't get into this profession to help people. I mean, I think at the core, that's, that's what drives us. Um, so it's certainly, you know, I think when you lose sight of that, um, 
things kind of go off the rails. But um, if you can keep that as a part of your focus, like you're, you really got into this for the purposes of, of helping others. And, and that's what keeps that human touch uh, on the forefront. So, I mean, uh, this is a very nice uh, information or other ni very nice tip for an audiologist that if you want to become an audiologist, you have to have that human connection. You have to have that patience to deal with the people and, you know, have a humanitarian touch to do the work in best possible man manner in the profession. I mean, and that's is even if you're in your office, you're still doing in many ways humanitarian work. Um, but for the purposes of bettering humanity, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, in somewhere, you know, in the jungles of Africa or you're sitting in your own urban clinic. It, it's the same sentiment. It's the same offering. Um, I, I just think, you know, if you start making distinguishes, that's where that hierarchy starts to happen. And the whole purpose is to break down that hierarchy. You know, it's not me as the doctor and I'm looking down and telling you what to do. I'm coming together with you where, where you are, regardless of where that is. And I just happen to have an expertise that can assist you. Yeah, that's true. Very much true. Uh, that's a fantastic point which you gave. Now, uh, you have done so much humanitarian work with your practices. I mean, do you have come across any uh, experience where you feel that, you know, you, you, you felt that this is something great, you know, which has happened to me? Any, any beautiful experience you would like to share? Yeah, I mean, I'll never forget my, my first mission experience. I mean, that I mean, it stays in your heart so deeply and so viscerally, um, which happened to be in India. So, I mean, I, I have such a special love for India. I've, I've been fortunate enough to have gone to India in different parts three different times. So um, I'm always looking for another excuse to come back there. Um, but my most uh, recent experience, I think right now for me sticks out because you know, when we think about global outreach or humanitarian efforts, um, we often think of places far and far away. And what I recently had the experience of is to set up a nonprofit project in my own backyard. I mean, with the pandemic happening, um, no one is traveling, no one is going anywhere. And a group of my colleagues from around the state of Colorado and I got together and said, you know, there's a lot of people in need and there's a lot of people out of work and may not have financial needs. And with the help of um, people like Nora Stewart, um, developed a program where we all kind of pooled our resources, pooled our efforts and, and our desires and said, what if we did this in our own backyard? There's plenty of people here in Colorado that have needs that, um, you know, we don't have to travel halfway around the world. We can, we can do it right here. And a lot of their resources have dried up during the pandemic. I mean, there were a number of different options that they may have had prior to this that were no longer available to them. So, um, for me, that's been an, an amazing gift to be able to um, not only give back to my own community, but to also share that experience with my colleagues. I mean, as I said in the beginning, you know, it's great to do this work and it gives you a lot of um, benefits um, personally, but then to say to my colleagues, hey, you know, you're not my, you're not my competitor, you're my colleague. And when we show up like colleagues and, and we work together, man, we can accomplish so much. And so I'm really excited that, you know, for my five other colleagues around the state, we will go, I will give my time to their community, just like they gave their time to my community. Um, and it's that give and take. And we've had other colleagues outside of us say, how, how can I help? What can I do? What do you need? You know, do you need hearing aids? Do you need, you know, expertise? Well, you know, what can I do to, 
to help with this because I think um, it's really needed. You know, that's something very nice, sharing information with other professionals. I mean, this is something, uh, today's example, you are sharing information with me. I mean, that's something really great. And I think our conversation will reach also to so many audiologists who will get inspired, you know, to share the information with each other. And uh, as uh, you rightly said that WHO has uh, found out, I mean, the statistics says that uh, there are 360 million people in the world and 6.3% population is hearing impaired and that in, in that 60% is adults and 40% it's kids and all over the uh, world only 10% global need is made especially hearing health care is concerned so we all audiologists have so much work that you know we can share the information help each other and can reach out to so many people you know to work for hearing health. So this is something very nice initiative you have taken and I wish that more and more audiologists can join you. Me too, me too. Because imagine what we could all accomplish if we all kind of got together and said, hey, we're gonna put our minds to it and we're gonna work together and, and see if we can make a, a dent in this 360 million people. I mean, we're, we're doing that, don't get me wrong. Like little by little, we're, we're putting a dent into it, but um, you know, we need to inspire a whole new generation of, of people to become audiologists, um, to, to jump into that arena, to see the magic that can happen from helping people hear better. I mean, it's not, you know, curing cancer, but it is a quality of life issue that um, you can improve the trajectory of someone else's life in an instant with what we do. As we discussed before, you know, hearing uh, health is something which is not visible, but if it is helped, you can overcome the hearing disability. So this is something uh, which we can reduce the liability from the society and, you know, we can make them self-dependent and uh, you know make them you know assets for uh, especially when i think about you know working with josh foundation uh, you know how your ntos work uh, we feel that uh, if the hearing impaired people are given a correct uh, diagnosis and treatment and then they can become a self dependent and can become a national assets so uh, we are capable of doing the changing doing and changing the life of people agreed Agreed. And, you know, who knows what that person can contribute? You yes. know, all, all you're doing is changing, changing how their life path may have gone. And then it's up to them. But you've at least given them the tools to um, pursue whatever their dreams are. I know. I mean, uh, I'll just give you an example that during this pandemic, uh, uh, when uh, a lot of things were happening, we were feeling low and uh, I, I was just thinking that, you know, I, I should look at, you know, these children with whom I work and uh, though they have difficulty, they just know how to grow further, you know, how to go ahead. They never look back. And I started, uh, you know, thinking about it. And I wrote, uh, started writing up blogs and I wrote all the examples or experiences of the, you know, working with the deaf children. And today I feel uh, if you have to look at, look for positivity or look for the people uh, from whom you get inspiration, you should look at them, you know, and working with them, you feel you get inspiration every day. And it's pure. Yes. I mean, there's there's no agenda around it. It's it's very pure. Yeah. So uh, I mean, we are so lucky to be in this profession, and you have shared a, such a lovely information, which I think each and every uh, private practitioners as an audiologist should follow in their practice. So I mean, in last, what message you would like to give it to the private practitioners? Yeah, and private practitioners are are my they're my people, right? Um, I started out, um, you know, I did maybe a year or two in kind of an ENT setting in a hospital setting, and then um, was a, an audiologist 
without owning a private practice in a private practice and then purchase that practice. So I, I feel like my whole career really is private practitioners. And what I think we often lose is, you know, we dance with change and we dance with adversity and uncertainty every day in private practice. And one of the beautiful things that we have the capability of doing is not just thinking outside of the box, but actually creating a bigger box. Um, you know, we don't we don't have to um, stay in a particular lane. We can think bigger and we have the flexibility and the ability to shift and change very rapidly, which is freeing, right? You, you're not confined to, you know, having to send things up the food chain for approval. I mean, we can have a conversation in my office like, hey, we want to help more people in our community and shift and change that on a dime. I don't have to ask anybody's permission. I just go out and start making connections in the community um, and reaching out and, and, you know, trying to meet and, and find resources. Um, we can do that. You, you don't have to wait for, you know, big organizations like, you know, I, I mean, I, I would love to see, you know, more big organizations get involved, but you can do that on, on even a very small scale in your own backyard. And that type of goodwill with your community is what will allow your practice to be more sustainable for the future because they will see you differently. They will see you not just as this person who has something to sell. They see you as a person who's there to find solutions. And that's a whole different kind of light than um, just the commoditization of things. Um, it's practicing with your whole heart. Um, and it's, it's giving yourself, your practice, and the community um, a hand up not just a handout. So, um, you know, I don't think that there has been many things in my 18 years of owning my practice that has done more for me, both personally and professionally than giving back. Yeah, that's just so wonderful message which you have given to private practitioners. I think uh, it's like, uh, you know, getting a blessings from God, you know, every day. <laughs> Helping, Absolutely. Helping, helping people and getting the blessings. I mean, this is a really nice way of uh, explanation which you had. Now, since you have been to India and you, uh, you know, love to come to India, I mean, which places did you travel to India? And I mean, oh. what, what do you feel, uh, have a special feeling for India? I mean, just let me know that. Well, my, my first trip to India was actually um, as a spiritual person pilgrim. Oh. I um, went and started in Rishikesh, uh, which I think for, for a West, uh, an American is probably a, an, an easy entry point. It's, it's quite a lovely, beautiful place up in the mountains. Um, being from Colorado, I was immediately drawn to it. Um, and then went to Varanasi and um, some of the, the places up north, which are so profoundly um, rich and beautiful and and cultural, um, it changed me. It it absolutely changed me as a human. And um, the people are just so lovely, um, you know, just as open hearted as I could ever imagine. And so I went to India in 2014, and like. It, as luck would have it, um, came back to India not even six months later for um, my very first mission, which was in Bangalore. Um, and so, you know, again, I had had this kind of spiritual connection with the, your country and, and the people, and then I got to come and serve 
and, and give back to them. It, so my heart is just always full for, for India. Well, that's something very nice. I mean, the spirit, I, I mean, I'm so happy to hear that you believe in spirituality and you feel so peaceful. I, I mean, I also believe in spirituality and uh, I feel this is something which, uh, you know, connection we all have, you know, today uh, being in this profession, uh, you know, being helping other, each other. Uh, and I think India has been, uh, you know, very uh, rich with uh, spirituality. And I, I am so happy that, you know, you really love coming to India. And I think uh, in future, we will do the project together so that we can help more people. <laughs> that, that would be amazing. You know, I, I always say, like, if, if anytime I have the opportunity, I, I got a 10-year visa and so I'm always like, you just let me know. I've got the visa. I can go. I'm, re I'm ready to go. <laughs> that, that's something really nice. I'm so happy to hear that, you know, that you, you love to come to India. So, uh, so nice of you to join and um, give so much information and give a humanitarian touch uh, with your spirituality experience as well. And uh, I believe that listening to you, many private practitioners will come forward and will see that, you know, how best, you know, they can help other people and uh, they do more ethical practice with the qualitative, uh, you know, keeping in mind. And uh, this is something very nice and very informative for all of us. And uh, I hope that in future we'll give, we will inspire many more audiologists to work like you, you know? Well, if there is anything that I can do, um, please, you know, relay to your listeners and your community. You know, I'm happy to be a resource. I'm happy to assist in any way that I can to anyone who's interested in um, combining their efforts of serving um, their business while also serving their community. I'm, I'm more than happy to be uh, a, a resource for you. You know, as uh, we say that Dhanyavad for doing such wonderful work. Mm -hmm. Thank you so <laughs> no. much. And I don't do it alone. I wanna make sure that everyone hears that message. It's, it is not, um, it's something that any of us do alone. We, but the more we work together, the, the better we're able to uplift all. Yeah, and I think that comes by gratitude. So thanks a lot for joining on this talk show. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, I, uh, you love India and I will see through it that, you know, I invite to uh, our India soon. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye.